Welcome to part two of our series on trash. This week, we found Nature Nate, another Nate, to talk trash with. His name is Alex Danovich, and he grew up going to dumps. Alex's whole career actually mirrors the development of trash in the U.S., from nonprofit actions to increasing corporatization to ultimately a collapse of trust in recycling. Through it all, Alex was still doing great work, so he's an excellent guide for us to explore waste in America. Alex co-founded one of the only non-profit recycling centers in the U.S. We caught up with him recently, where he geeked out with NatureNade on so many things garbage. Hey, my name is Alex Danovich, and I'm a principal at Nothing Left to Waste, which is a consulting company that collaborates with municipalities, institutions, companies to implement zero waste strategies to reduce their waste and move to a more sustainable future. We hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi, I'm Nature Nate. I'm a garbage geek, and I used to be a trash man just like my guest Alex. And this is Waste Not, Why Not, a podcast on how not to save the environment. Hi, well, welcome, Alex. Welcome to Waste Not, Why Not. Thank you. I understand that you're a, a garbage person. I am a garbage person. When did this begin? I think we were talking earlier, and you said that you know we, we kind of had a shared childhood history and that we would go to the recycling center with our parents. Yeah, we definitely grew up going to the recycling. We called it the dump uh, every week. But you um, physically went we to the dump. We physically went to the dump, which was not dump-like. It was a very nice dump. Uh, <laughs> and where, what, where was this? This is in a suburb of Boston, Wellesley, Massachusetts. Okay. It's a affluent suburb. I'm not sure how that or why that happened in Wellesley, but they have a long history of having just this incredible drop-off program Throughout the week, we're collecting all of the sorts. So you got to sort at home to you get ready to, to sort at home. So we had like six or seven paper bags lined up in the hallway all week long that would fill up with you know metal and plastic. Saturday or Sunday would come around, and mom would say, "We got to go to the dump, <laughs> load up the trunk." That was always my job. Yeah, that was my job too. We had a Volkswagen bus, and we would have we had big trash barrels, and so I would put it in the Volkswagen bus and drive down. And then you get there and you you walk between all the containers. You might have to drive to a few different locations. Well, this, is a, this is a big dump. It's a big dump, yeah. There's picnic tables. There's a reuse area, a okay. book swap. A book uh, swap? A book swap, yep. This was, this was clean. It was sort of like just like a big It was field. clean. It was like landscaped. It wasn't like mountains of trash. So the trash was going into like compactors so you couldn't okay. you know there definitely is a prominent area for straight up garbage okay but there are mountains of like yard waste they had the composting so you can that everything. was kind of fun yeah you they're way ahead of their time they're way ahead of their time it's really amazing you know they have probably 15 to 20 different sorts for recycling they process it themselves send it right to end markets they have a huge sign that wow. says how much money is saved to the taxpayers every year because you also dispose of your garbage there. And any Wellesley resident has a sticker on their car, so they, they drive in there, it's totally free, everything's totally free, but there's just this cultural phenomenon that happened where people are really avid about sorting their recycling into all these streams and it's still going on today. Wow, Yeah, that's, that's incredible. <laughs> So yeah. that was that typical for the time in the US? Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I did not realize that either. You know, I just I grew up, you know, this I think I normal. got to college and I was like, what, y'all didn't go to like your dump every week to drop off your 17 sorted recycling? <laughs> so you were ahead of the curve when you were younger and then you went to college and then they they didn't recycle. Well, you just, you know, you get to college and it's this amazing time where people that grew up in all these different places and different ways you know come together and you're like oh my god the world is so much bigger than i thought and uh yeah and you're at you know we don't recycle our kids yeah here. yeah you're at, you're at your first party and you're like oh this beer is great and then you're like wait a second why is it in the trash can and it's like and it's really this phenomenon you know you're just so used to 
doing something where you know there's value to a material and you're recycling and you grow up that way and then to see something in the garbage is really kind of... A beer pong game is just a, a nightmare of unrecyclable plastics. That's right. <laughs> what what was kind of the typical waste management structure in the U.S.? When, when was this? Uh, uh, this how was, old are you? <laughs> yeah. This was, you know, I mean... I left uh, for college in 1992, so okay. it was 80s and 90s. So there was there was obviously recycling in the U.S. at this point. There oh, was yeah. Some model deposits. Could you kind of describe that waste management system at the time? Yeah, well, I think in the United States, and it's still true today, it varies greatly from mm. city to city and state to state. There's no real uniform way. I think most big cities today have some sort of... Um, organized collection or franchise system where you're paying for your garbage and you're recycling through your taxes or your water bill in every house. You know, there's only one company driving by your house to pick up trash and recycling. But uh, there's still huge parts of the country where you're just on your own for trash and recycling. So the Hmm. city or the town you live in doesn't provide anything at all. And you call up, you know, your favorite garbage hauler and you contract with them. So you just have to figure it out yourself, basically. You not only have to figure it out yourself, you have to negotiate the price yourself with these haulers. And you can be paying two to three times as much as your neighbor for the exact same service. Wow. I think most people in the U.S., their default assumption is just that this is how everyone deals with their garbage. They probably don't realize that it's renegotiated at a county level, but also you're saying at a at a home level, oh, yeah. there could be different negotiations. Is that just because of U.S. law was set up that way? You know, there there is no national law um, oh, on well, recycling or <laughs> garbage. So it's, 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 you know, there are states that have laws and there are cities that have laws in terms of landfill bans or requirements to offer recycling services. Um, so you grew up going to the dump, this very clean dump, and then you went to college. And is that where you're... Your trash passion, your your trashing <laughs> formed. Um, How did you get into the world of garbage? Yeah, it was it was. A, yeah, I was interested in the connection between economics and environmental impact. But when I graduated, I was working at a bike shop. Uh, you know, college money well spent. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Realizing well, that's a valuable that, service. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. But then. I was in St. Paul, Minnesota. There was a great nonprofit organization that was overseeing St. Paul's recycling program, doing a lot of work in energy efficiency at the time. And they had a uh, AmeriCorps Vista position open. Um, I think what's it was, a, and what's AmeriCorps? AmeriCorps is a national program in the United States that you basically do a year of service, uh, independent community-based project work. Uh, And so I I think I started a month later um, and spent that year doing a program that made pallet or used pallets, old discarded wood pallets for for shipping. shipping. Yeah. Which you get some beautiful hardwoods because the stuff's being shipped from from Southeast Asia, you know. (laughs) So you're getting these tropical (laughs) hardwoods that were used for shipping pallets. And so we were using those to make planners and garden boxes and working with people with disabilities. It was a program through the National Recycling Coalition at the time called Recycling to Build Community. Wow, that's really cool. You know, I was in that world and in that the organization I was at was also overseeing the recycling program for the city of St. Paul, which at the time they were contracting out to a local hauler, independent hauler, and they had a county run recycling facility, a MRF, material recovery facility it's called, that was processing the material, was source separated, you know, 12 or 13 sorts at the curb that the drivers so, are picking up. What's a MRF for people who haven't been to MRFs or don't know what those are? Yeah. I think it's hard for the average person to comprehend what happens to their garbage after it leaves their home. Yeah. So the MRF is where all of your recycling is sorted into the various grades that ultimately go to a manufacturer who uses that as feedstock to make new products. So there's a, a specified grade that those manufacturers buy. It might be PET, plastic pop bottle or soda bottles pop, as we say in Minnesota, (laughs) which I haven't lived in in a while. Um, Or it might be newspaper or cardboard or aluminum cans. So the MRF just organizes those, collects them, makes sure they're clean enough, makes sure they're the right color and type, and then puts it into kind of like a 
a bale or a yeah it densifies it so that it's it's more economic to ship you don't it. just send a sack full of cans like, <laughs> no. to the factory and say, nope. good luck <laughs> yeah there's these big expensive balers that crush it into you know 1,000 or 1,500 pound uh, okay. cubes that so you can really maximize you know 20,000 pounds on a semi truck Right. Um, and so it makes your shipping costs a lot lower. So it's just like manufacturing. You don't just send like chunks of coal to a factory. There's like processing that has to happen. That's right. And so you, you were doing this? So no. So, well, at, not yet. <laughs> so at the, at the organization I was at, they were overseeing that with a, a county run facility. And at the time in, you know, the early nineties, late eighties, there were a lot of nonprofits and municipally run facilities running recycling. And it was really community based, you know, recycling was clearly about environmental impact. Um, it was, you know, a way for the community to discard, divert material from landfills and, Uh, get environmental gains so they were run by the community and really reflected the values of the community i think things have changed things things (laughs) changed and they changed really fast so as i was working on this pallet program (laughs) the organization i was at got a letter saying the county's shutting down their facility waste management uh, which is a large multinational corporation they're the largest recycler in the u.s just by sheer volume you know i think they're 14 billion dollar company something was opening up a recycling facility and the county said hey it's great private companies taking this over we don't need to be in the recycling industry anymore um and then at the same time we renewed our collection contract with this independent hauler who had been collecting material for 10 years in in the city of saint paul uh, about 20 minutes after we signed that contract with the independent hauler, they sold to guess who? <laughs> Waste management. Wow. So you so you had agreed to work with this independent hauler, and then they just immediately sold to Waste Management. So that meant that you basically just signed a contract with Waste Management. Correct. So now we had recycling collection and recycling processing under control of Waste Management, a multinational corporation whose headquarters were in Texas, who were, you know are sending at the time they had a mandated 30% profit on every contract they had that was going directly into shareholder pockets instead of back into the community in terms in the form of more programs and environmental services so this is pretty drastic change and this was happening all across the u.s there's this huge consolidation of the industry um, and there was a move away from community driven and community run programs to for-profit uh, trash hauler programs. Um, so just almost overnight, garbage went from something that communities did as just a way of doing something environmental. I feel like this is probably born out of the, you know Earth Day in the 1970s. That's and that, right. That movement, and then it became a, a, a big business, basically. That's right, recycling specifically. Recycling. Trash was probably always a big trash business. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, luckily there was some visionary leadership at the organization that said, I don't think recycling's done. And uh, we actually, to waste management's dismay, (laughs) within a year we were able to pull together some funding and um, launch, spin off another nonprofit, Eureka Recycling, which I was able to be a co-founder of, that uh, launched our own collection fleet and started a two-stream MRF at the time. So, so what was happening was basically before the city, the nonprofit was sourcing all this material and then waste management comes in and they say, you don't need to separate this anymore. So this was in 2001 when single stream and the blue bin was becoming really popular and people could just put everything in that. And But with that was this unintended, or maybe it was an intended consequence of reducing the quality of recycling because it's, it's really hard to pull everything apart once it's in that blue bin. And so that's right. Yeah, there was a huge shift from source separated material where we basically were picking this stuff at the curb, the drivers, they were sorting it into these different compartments on the truck. So if something wasn't recyclable, they just left it in the bin. And then the person who had that household was like, oh, I guess this isn't recyclable. I'll stop putting it in the curb, you know, at the curb. Right. I'll frame it this way. 99% of the material that was delivered on those trucks to our facility was sent to an end market to be made into a new product. Wow. Okay. So with single stream, that made everything worse. So it was kind of this this dovetailing of waste management companies just increasing their costs over time, uh, manufacturers not really thinking about end of life for their products. And that made it so that there was just a lot of recycling for, it sounds like a very, very long time was not going where people thought it was going. Yeah. Shattered. So then we moved to single stream where you have a huge cart, the driver's picking it up with a truck that has a robotic arm on it. Nobody's looking in those carts or seeing what's in there. So it's no, just blue bin. 
in the truck, blue bin in the truck. That's right. And at the same time, to make it worse, the packaging manufacturers had this huge proliferation of different types of plastics they were using in their packaging. You know, everything used to be glass. Now try to find a bottle of ketchup in glass. You can't do it. So now there's all these different types of packaging. Now all of those, you know, plastic bottles are turning into tubes and flexible packaging and it's just continued to grow, right? And so every one of those pieces of plastic has a chasing arrow symbol on it that makes you think, oh, this must be recyclable. And the manufacturer wants you to think it's recyclable because they know consumers don't want to buy things that aren't recyclable. So all that material is ending up in this big blue bin. So that plastic's recycling arrow, that doesn't mean that it's recyclable. It does not. It's just, it's just like a tattoo. And there's it's no, just it's, something <laughs> invented by the plastics industry. But it's, there, there's, I mean, my understanding is that like, number one, that's all PET. Like, but there's, you can't just recycle it just because it's all PET. Well, PET is very recyclable. Right. So like PET is number one, right? And then HDPE is number two. Polypropylene is number five. Those three numbers are very recyclable okay. in, in the United States. Right. Um, they have good domestic markets. They have good international markets. Well, then add into that China's demand for recycled materials, right? So okay. China's at this whole same time period shipping tons and tons of things that they manufacture, widgets to the United States on these huge freight boats, right? We're not sending anything back to China. So there's this amazingly cheap transportation back to China. They need packaging for all the stuff we're buying from them. They build these huge mills that are consuming plastics and paper right. really efficiently. Honestly, they're great mills and it makes sense. They need the material. So let's and if send they're sending them. empty boxes, might as well fill it let's with, send it with back. something yeah. that has some kind of economic value. They're not sending trash to China, right? That's right. Yeah, no, China was paying for this material and paying exorbitantly in some cases, you know, more than the domestic markets could pay to compete with it. And so, like, uh, okay. especially on the West Coast, all the paper mills went out of business or didn't, you know, when it came time to recapitalize, they said there's no way we can compete with China. So basically it ended up, I think 60% of all the recycling in the U.S. was being exported to China at the probably three years ago. Wow. And so during this time, how are you surviving? How is, how is your, how is your, <laughs> well, that's like, this was the existing. heyday of recycling. Actually. I mean, markets were really good. China was consuming okay. a lot of material and, you know, I mean, there was a few blips in recessions in the economy that certainly recycling markets are cyclical and they go up and down. But recycling became pretty valuable, like a ton of material at a typical composition of what you'd pick up at the curb. You know, it could be worth over $100 a ton easily. Wow. This time. Yeah. And the processing cost was maybe $80 a ton. Okay. So, so recycling was making money. The value of that material was more than the cost to process it for a long time. And people got used to this. And China wanted the material so badly that they were like turned a total blind eye to how much contaminant those three, four, sevens were in the recycling stream. And, and this was this was in the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and like then, when, until... and then the, when did the dream end? The dream ended two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this whole time, there's this for-profit world where they're focused on collection efficiencies, pushing the stuff through the MRF as fast as possible, getting as much money from the material from China as they can. At the same time, Eureka Recycling, the organization that I was a co-founder of in St. Paul, was focused on creating local markets and opportunities uh, through recycling, paying our drivers and our sorters living wages, creating a different model for recycling. Okay. How much, how much were you paying these people? The living way, I can't remember exactly what the living wage was, but I think, you know, $15 an hour for wow. sorters. You know, drivers are easily making mid 20s an hour. And 20, wow. You know, so it's just, you're sort of like the, the Costco of. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like you actually pay your worker. People, I assume, want to work there. Cause, yeah, yeah. Because when you see, you can look up videos of recycling, single stream sorting facilities, and it's dismal. It's a conveyor belt going, you know. Oh, yeah. Like, like so many miles an hour, and people just throwing bottles out, and it's not. It's loud, it's smelly, it's it's stressful. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that way, but it's <laughs> it's certainly the, the norm and a lot of it Murphs use temp labor. You know, we had this real it's like recycling shouldn't be built on the backs of the lowest paid employees in the organization. So you know, and we were a nonprofit organization, but we acted as a for profit. We were almost ninety eight percent 
fee for service. So we weren't taking grants or foundation money, but we were showing that instead of paying money to your shareholders, you could pay your employees living wage and still compete in the marketplace. Okay. Um, and and was, was Eureka sending waste to China as well? Uh, we did send paper specifically, maybe some plastic occasion. We weren't against export, sure. but we were more just interested in the fact that, you know, local markets, by marketing it locally, you're going to create more jobs and use your resources locally to benefit your local community. So we liked right. that model. Right. You know, Do you have any cool reuse stories for some, like some materials that you were being reused locally? I mean, the planters are a good example. Is there any kind of like... People use upcycling. I feel like that yeah. word's been ruined because it used it used to mean that you took something of lower value and made it into something of higher value, right? Now right, just, right. Now people just assume upcycling means turning something into something else. I know. You know, I love the boutique stories of all this cool stuff you can do with your second. But really, at the end of the day, we're dealing with 100,000 tons of material. They can't all be bracelets. They can't all be <laughs> bracelets. So, you know, I mean, uh, you know, 60 or 70 percent of the material is fiber and we were lucky to have a fiber mill located about four or five miles away from our facility so that's a really cool story fiber Um, for like clothing yeah they were making cereal boxes so it's kellogg is a big minnesota company and they were making cereal boxes and cardboard liners so currently i think we ship about 90 percent of the material stays in the state of minnesota um and you know 100 percent is in north america right now so it's possible to do it, but we were lucky to be in the Midwest where it wasn't as impacted by the export markets and okay. the loss of domestic local markets. The two things that have been hit the hardest by China's export uh, or import ban is mixed paper and mixed plastics. And so like Eureka sorts plastics that we don't ship mixed plastics. So that was a choice that many MRFs made based on the fact that China was buying it for so much money. It didn't make sense for them to sort it because they could So China was just buying, hey, just send us a bunch of mixed plastics and we'll we'll sort it. it, Allegedly. Exactly. Well, and they were paying for the material. It was, it had that value. The problem was there was a bunch of non-recyclable plastics in there. Sure. And they weren't being responsibly dealt with those non-recyclable plastics. So... What happened with uh, Eureka's plastics? So Eureka pushed really hard never to accept one through seven plastics. You're probably one of the only facilities in the country. Um, but there was a lot of pressure to do plastic at all. No, we accepted ones, twos, and fives. Oh, okay. okay. The only, so we, we had this philosophy (laughs) that we would only accept material that had multiple end markets, uh, stable end markets. So So that's why some city, were there bans? on styrofoam or this is sort of like a de facto ban on polyesterine basically right uh, there's no styrofoam ban just it was not included in the recycling program okay. so it was in the trash it's oh, not like okay. yeah yeah okay i thought there'd be some kind of like ideal incentive right where like we don't accept styrofoam <laughs> so don't buy it right well that's you know we we worked with the city to implement some like to go packaging ordinance that says restaurant can only provide to-go packaging that's accepted in the recycling or the composting program. Okay. I think Seattle has that now. I think many, many cities in the U.S. have that. Yeah. But also many cities like in St. Paul or in Minnesota, they uh, ended up with a preemption ban against the ability to ban plastic bags. So they, they, St. Paul banned the ability to ban. Well, Minnesota did. Yeah. Yeah. So the bag industry comes in really strong and says, Hey, you're going to lose jobs. This happened in Pennsylvania too this year. It's happening all over the plastics industry. You know, kind of pit the old jobs versus environment uh, and say, you know, we need all those plastic bag jobs. All those plastic (laughs) bag jobs. Well, and the reality is as, as we become more efficient with our fuel consumption, there's less and less demand for oil and gas. And at the same time, all these companies are investing in fracking. There's more and more oil available. That mm-hmm. There's a report that says by 2050, they're planning on 50% of oil production being used to make plastic products. Yeah, I've heard that as well. And But what you're showing with Eureka and other nonprofit recyclers is that you can have jobs through recycling. So really, this whole China ban was an opportunity for the U.S. to sort of reorganize recycling. And instead, they chose to... I wasn't in the U.S. when this was happening. I was in Asia during China's ban. So what, what did the U.S. do when China stopped uh, receiving plastic and other kinds of waste imports? Yeah, first, I'll, I'll agree with you that this is an opportunity in that a lot of recyclers like Eureka and other nonprofit recyclers around the country and other advocates saw these problems coming, that recycling wasn't the answer that everybody thought it was to just throw everything in the recycling bin, keep consuming. That's not the answer, and it's still not the answer. Unfortunately... 
the reaction in the United States has been more like, oh, no, recycling's dead. It doesn't work. Um, Can only be dead or perfect. There's no <laughs> Exactly. It's this pendulum switch to throw everything in to it's totally broken. And, and so we're seeing a lot of communities drop recycling programs that we're seeing more material go to incinerators and other false solutions like gasification or paralysis. All of these non-circular approaches that just – rely on continued consumption and continued extraction of, of new resources. So it's a pretty scary time right now. And it's, I think it's an important message to know that recycling does still work. It costs more because there's less demand because China's not buying material anymore, but that's, you know, the, we've gone through these cycles before in the recycling industry. We're seeing a lot of investment in local markets. Unfortunately, a lot of it's from foreign companies coming in and opening up recycling processing, especially China's now spent hundreds of millions of dollars on domestic processing in the United States. Wow, what a deal Chinese for them. Chinese-owned companies, yeah, <laughs> because they're just exporting now pulp instead of waste paper. Which, um, is, which is probably what maybe should have happened to begin with. Yeah. If they were going to have that kind of equitable import relationship. Yeah, yeah. Hi, this is Future Nate. Alex and I had so much fun that we forgot to stop talking. So, this is your break. Pills. Human beings use a lot of them, but it's bad for the environment. According to a global study, two-thirds of test sites had an unsafe level of antibiotics in the water. That makes it easier for superbugs to spread into the wild. To raise awareness of this critical issue, Legacy Lab International, an art studio in Taipei, wants your pills. Well, they want your old pills. Don't worry, rave kids. They will create mixed media art pieces with your real pills to draw attention to this global threat. Check our show description on how to send in your pills. Recycle old medicine, make art, raise awareness, call out Big Pharma. It's a perfect combo. Waste not your pills, why not make some art? Okay, now back to the rest of the interview. Okay, so so the future of waste in the U.S. is kind of dim looking. Then. I think there's some excitement and some optimism that people are finally understanding that recycling isn't the answer. We need to focus on reduction. And there's, right. there's some items, you know, that are great for recycling that can be continuously circular and really fit well in a system. There's other items, right. you know, there's some downcycling going on, but I think it's still important to say... You know, that should still be in the recycling stream for now as we work on alternatives to those products. Are there other nonprofit recyclers in the U.S.? Like if anyone's listening, could they could they switch their hauler? I mean, there's four main nonprofit recyclers okay. that, and they're all working together now to kind of get this narrative out there that, hey, recycling's not the answer, but recycling is an important step. So don't give up on recycling, but focus on reuse mm. and reduction. But yeah, so there's EcoCycle in Boulder, Colorado. There's Recycle Ann Arbor in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ecology Center in Berkeley, California. And Eureka Recycling in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Those are kind of the four, like, OG recyclers that are left. Some Original of them garbage. Been, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of them have been around since, since the 70s. Um, recycling. Out of that first movement. Basically. Yeah, yeah. So if you live in one of those cities, look up those centers. That's right. That's are there right. any other uh, resources you would recommend for people who are listening if they want to learn more about? Yeah, I mean, I think n just the fact that you don't have a nonprofit recycler doesn't mean that you're you're doomed. There's plenty of recycling going on and there's good people at all of these facilities. If you can take the opportunity to get to know where your trash is going is a great first step. In, in visit your Murph. Visit your Murph. Take a tour. <laughs> Get to know your garbage, become intimate. <laughs> Don't be scared. Shirt. It doesn't just disappear, I think, is the thing that you get really... Get intimate with garbage. Get intimate yeah. with garbage. That'd be like a <laughs> tattoo, I feel like. Yeah. I think there's opportunities for everyone, and there's always improvements that are able to be made, and there's always things you can look at yourself in terms of your consumption habits. See, there's people you can, you know, talk to your elected officials about policies that could be made. And What are some good policies? I'm, I'm out here harping on extended producer responsibility because yeah. I've seen that work so well in Taiwan and Europe and the U.S. It's like every couple of years, some people are like, let's do EPR. And then it, it kind of dies. It's, how's that going in the U.S.? Are there other policies that people should be supporting? Because I think that most people, they hear about recycling dying and they just don't even, what, what do 
that was that was the solution. What are we supposed to do instead? Right, right, right. Yeah, I think EPR is the ultimate solution. I mean, it's if it's done right, and it's extremely difficult in the U.S. because corporations have so much power. You know, thanks to Citizens United, it's challenging the powerful industry voices like create these bills that make it illegal to have a ban on materials. Um, these preemption bills, you know, it's driven by these corporations. And so, well, the, these same corporations are pouring tons and tons of money into recycling and pushing these voluntary efforts. They're also fighting against any sort of legislation that holds them responsible and accountable for the packaging they're using. So I think we're seeing some of the tides shift. You know, uh, we saw Coke and Pepsi pull out of an industry group that was fighting yeah, Coke uh, legislation. Used to, Coke used to fight recycling laws a lot. Yeah. And um, it seems like, I mean, I, th- I think a few years ago, they kind of had a foot in both worlds. Maybe there was some people right. who wanted Coke to support recycling and maybe others didn't. And But now it seems like they're starting to take it seriously. They made that commitment to recycle one bottle for every bottle they produce. And yeah. at least from, from my perspective, that seems better. And now there are companies like Ikea, and then there's also textile companies that are creating demand for recycled materials. Yeah. Is that is that helping? Is that Yeah, I mean I think better? it I think it helps with recycling. I think it helps to the point of reduction, right? Nobody in any sort of corporate environment is going to talk about reduction. And so that's where I think legislation needs to really come in as well as voluntary corporate. You know, and I th- I think there is an effort for corporations to want to use recycled content material and are they going to start embracing policies that make that more available to them and more cost effective? But, you know, really, that's alone not going to be the answer. We really need to also be talking about reduction. But there there are bans on reduction as well, sort of like de facto bans, right? Like for franchise agreements, when, when St. Paul signed that contract with waste management, they had to guarantee a certain amount of waste, right? That's typical for uh, incinerator contracts, like a put or pay contract. So like Philadelphia has that with Covant. You have to make waste to feed the incinerator. That's right. And so, yeah, what's their incentive for reduction when they're going to be paying the same amount for garbage? I think that's something that we really need to fight against any sort of put or pay contracts. Yeah, what's what's interesting is in Taiwan, because everything is sort of managed by the, the government. I mean, there are variances in county levels. Taipei has really, really good recycling. If you go to Pingdong, it's, it's not as good, but there's still... <laughs> There's still like a cohesive sort of national identity for garbage. And so you see things now with certain incinerators in Taiwan are are below capacity. And I don't think they're fining like the government itself. I think it's just they're somehow able to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, if that's uh, reducing Maybe that ship sailed for the U.S., but... (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, and I think that's the fear is that as we're having problems with markets, more incinerators are going to come in. And once you build an incinerator, you have to feed the beast. You know, it's right. It's and then it makes it that much harder for reduction and diversion efforts to happen. So it's kind of a critical time for people to say, you know, we don't need more disposal capacity to address this crisis. We need efforts in reduction and and we need to keep recycling, not reduce recycling as we make that transition. So start with reduction and then recycling is sort of your. Your second, your interim strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's not the long term solution, but it's an important immediate strategy. Okay. Um, And then pay as you throw, I think, is the other piece that Taiwan is rocking. Pay as you throw. Yeah. Yeah. Where you have to buy a bag for your trash. Yeah. That's a powerful policy. I could not imagine the U.S. (laughs) adopting that. Maybe, maybe some parts of the U.S. I think a lot of Americans just, I mean, I didn't know. I came to Taiwan the first time and I was just blown away. I mean, the first time I came to Taiwan was in 2013, and I was came here to do research on sort of China and Taiwan and their relationship, but I was an environmental student, so I immediately gravitated towards garbage. And in Taiwan, the most striking thing is that there's no litter, there's also no bins, and you see people washing like little styrofoam trays <laughs> that used to have meat on it. Yeah. I'm like, okay, are these people OCD or there's something going on here? And uh, I'm awesome. still here talking about garbage, so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So as, is there anything that you've learned now as an adult that you'd want to go back and tell younger Alex about garbage? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think it, you know, I think at the time there was just this mentality that, you know, recycling was just what you did with your recyclables. Right. I think I wasn't as aware or conscious of You know, for every bag of garbage downstream, there's 30 bags of garbage upstream in the manufacturing extraction. And I think now I've realized, hey, recycling and waste diversion are important tools, but 
really the impact is around extraction and manufacturing. And if we can't address our ridiculous consumption in the United States compared to the rest of the world, we can't just recycle our way out of this, you know, out of control consumption. So I think it's it's really thinking through that embedded energy and everything that went into those items that we're discarding and, and thinking beyond just, hey, we need to keep this out of a landfill. It's It's much more about what went into that product on the upstream side. That's the thing about consumption. You know, people say, oh, population is the issue. But if you look at how much the U.S. consumes per capita, it's way more consumption is the issue, not population. Oh, oh yeah. No, I remember <laughs> I remember being a kid going to the zoo and there was what was the worst environmental issue. And everyone in the bus got like a different issue. And I was like slash and burn ag- agriculture. And so I thought I was super witty. And I'm like, it's me. It's, it's cutting down rainforests. And they're like, no. And then they point at these other kids. They're like, it's these ones, the twins, overpopulation. There's too many people on earth. And that's what I grew up believing for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then you have places like China that have this one child policy. And then and then you kind of realize and think about it. And you're like, wait, it's not the number of people. It's how they're living. Right. It, and I hear that a lot from environmentalists, though. They always talk about population like it's like this huge problem. But I think an American can have like 10 times the environmental impact of someone else on the planet. That's right. All right, Alex, thanks for coming in today. Thank you for sharing with us about garbage. It's always great to meet a fellow garbage person. It feels feels validating. It feels like I'm not some insane person yeah, likewise. out here advocating. So thanks for coming in, and I hope uh, you come back to Taiwan soon. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was great to hear about Taiwan's perspective and, and learn all of the amazing things that are going on here. So. Great. Is there any way people can – do you have social media? Is there any way they can follow you? Should they follow, you know, Eureka Recycling? Yeah, no, I, my, my consulting company is called Nothing Left to Waste and it's uh, www.nl2w.com. Okay, check it out. Check out Nothing Left to Waste and um, waste not your time. Go check out Alex's website and uh, stop yes. using single-use plastics. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, thank you. This has been the Waste Not, Why Not podcast recorded in Taipei, Taiwan in a space provided by our good friend, Anonymous. Subscribe to our show wherever you get podcasts. Give us a good rating on Apple. Support us on Patreon. We are Waste Not, Why Not on Patreon and Facebook and Waste Not Pod on Twitter. This has been a Ghost Island Media production recorded on a Yeti microphone provided by Blue. This episode was produced by Emily Y. Wu and myself, Nature Nate. Edited by Emily Y. Wu. Original theme song by Chris Lowe. Thanks for listening, Aunt Kelly. Bye-bye.